In 1927, British engineers tried to end the war between steam and oil, not by choosing a side, but by forcing both to burn together inside one piston. It did not burn coal, it burned oil twice, chasing total efficiency. On paper, it reclaimed wasted heat and promised to save the future of rail. But this perfect hybrid almost bankrupted its makers instead. If physics finally let you capture every ounce of energy, why did it turn into the most complicated way to go broke? The answer begins with a simple number. 65% of engine power was lost before the Kitson still even moved. Every engine is a battlefield between fuel and waste. For every gallon of oil burned in a typical locomotive, nearly two-thirds of its energy never reaches the wheels. About 65% escapes as heat, blasted out the exhaust stack, lost through the radiator, or radiated away from metal surfaces. That means, for every 100 pounds of fuel delivered to a railway yard, only about 35 are turned into motion. The rest is invisible loss, paid for, but never used. In the 1920s, steam locomotives were even worse offenders, often wasting more than 80% of their fuel's potential. Internal combustion engines, diesel, petrol, or oil offered a step up, but even their best designs of the era threw away most of what they burned. The laws of thermodynamics did not care about ambition or economics. Hot exhaust roared out of the cylinders, cooling water sapped energy just to keep the engine from melting, and all that paid for heat drifted into the sky. Railway accountants saw the waste in their ledgers. Every mile run meant a pile of money spent on fuel that never moved a single ton of freight. Engineers saw it in the design charts, giant arrows showing where energy vanished. The problem was not subtle. The biggest single cost after wages was fuel, and most of it did nothing useful. This was not a hidden flaw or a minor inefficiency. It was a gaping wound in every engine room and locomotive shed. The challenge was simple to state and nearly impossible to solve. How do you capture the 65% of energy that engines throw away? That question haunted inventors like William Still. He looked at the roaring exhaust and the scalding hot water jacket and saw opportunity, not defeat. If you could trap that wasted heat and turn it into power, you could rewrite the rules of railway economics. The dream was to build an engine where nothing was lost, where every drop of oil did double duty and every degree of heat was put to work. The result would be a machine that promised to turn the physics of waste into the mathematics of profit. William J. Still was not content to let heat slip away into the sky. Where others saw waste, he saw a second chance for every calorie of energy. In the years after World War I, Still filed a series of patents that challenged the basic logic of the engine room. His proposal was simple in outline, but radical in ambition. Use the heat that engines normally throw away to create more power, not just more steam. Instead of cooling an engine with water that left as lukewarm waste, still systems circulated boiling water from the boiler through the engine's jackets. The idea was to keep the metal hot, not cold, so that every degree stolen from combustion would come back as usable steam. But Still's vision did not stop at the cooling system. He looked at the exhaust gases, scorching hot and full of untapped energy, and routed them through a network of tubes inside the boiler. Instead of venting straight to the atmosphere, the exhaust would heat the boiler water even further, raising more steam for free. This was cogeneration in its purest form, every ounce of waste heat was captured and pressed back into work. The heart of Still's plan was the double-acting piston, a design more common in marine engines than on the rails. Each piston would be pushed down by the explosive force of oil combustion, then pulled up by the expansion of steam on the return stroke. The same cylinder, the same piston, but two entirely different sources of power, one violent, one smooth. Both sides drew from the same basic fuel, heavy oil. Oil burned in the diesel cycle, and oil burned in the boiler to make steam. The exhaust from one process became the lifeblood of the other. Still's calculations promised a leap in efficiency. 
where a conventional steam locomotive might turn only 10% of its fuel into motion and a diesel perhaps 30%, the still system aimed for 40% or more. The theory was elegant. Combine the high starting torque of steam with the fuel economy of oil engines and do it all in a single tightly integrated machine. The engine would start as a steam locomotive, then transform into a diesel as speed increased, always recycling its own waste. Kitson and company, a respected locomotive builder in Leeds, saw the potential and licensed Stills patents. The challenge ahead was immense, to take this bold thermodynamic vision and turn it into hardware that could survive the daily grind of railway work. The dream was clear, a locomotive that captured every lost degree, that squeezed value from every drop of oil, and that could finally break the tyranny of wasted energy. At the heart of the Kitson still locomotive sat a mechanical paradox, a double-acting piston designed to do two jobs at once. Unlike a typical engine, where each piston face serves a single master, this machine forced one side of the piston to endure the violence of diesel combustion, while the opposite face worked quietly under the pressure of steam. Both forces acted in the same cylinder and were linked by a common crankshaft that turned their combined efforts into motion. The layout was unconventional even by the bold standards of the 1920s. Eight cylinders arranged in two horizontal banks stretched across the frame. Each cylinder housed a piston with two distinct faces. The outboard end faced the diesel chamber, where heavy oil was injected and ignited by compression, unleashing a blast of heat and pressure that hammered the piston inward. On the return stroke, the inboard face met a rush of steam admitted through its own set of valves. This second force, drawn from the oil-fired boiler and the jacket water heated by the engine itself, pulled the piston back to its starting point. The result was a continuous cycle explosion and expansion, combustion and condensation, both working through the same moving part. The crankshaft running the length of the power unit collected the force from all eight pistons and delivered it to a jackshaft and then to the driving wheels. Every revolution meant two distinct power events for each piston, one from diesel and one from steam, timed and balanced so that the engine never paused between them. To make this possible, the cylinder block was a maze of passages and ports. Each end required its own set of intake and exhaust valves, with the diesel side fitted for injectors and scavenging, and the steam side equipped with traditional valve gear. The cooling jacket, instead of carrying away waste heat to a radiator, circulated boiling water from the boiler, keeping the metal hot enough to aid ignition and generate more steam. Diesel exhaust, instead of being thrown out, was routed through tubes in the boiler, squeezing out every possible degree of energy before escaping. No other locomotive of the era attempted such a direct union of two rival technologies. The double-acting still piston was both a technical marvel and a maintenance challenge. It demanded precision in timing, sealing, and lubrication, because any imbalance could mean lost power, wasted fuel, or a breakdown that required dismantling both the steam and diesel systems interwoven around each other. Yet on paper, the concept promised a kind of mechanical harmony. Two engines, one piston, no wasted motion. The next challenge would be to see how this delicate balance played out when the locomotive left the drawing board and met the realities of railway operation. Before dawn, the depot crew assembled around the Kitson still a machine that demanded a ritual all its own. The fireman turned the oil valve, listening for the muted rush of ignition beneath the boiler. Instead of coal and ash, there was the sharp tang of burning oil and the shimmer of heat rising from the stack. The process was deliberate, 45 minutes of waiting as cold water slowly surrendered to the rising temperature. The pressure gauge barely moved at first, then inched upward, marking the slow approach to readiness. No shortcuts, no rushing, only patience and the steady discipline of men who knew every sound and scent of the engine's waking. With steam finally in the green, the driver eased open the regulator. The locomotive stirred, moving with a quiet grace that belied its bulk. There was no clatter, 
just the hiss of vapor and the smooth pull of eight pistons working in unison. For these first moments, the Kitson still was all steam, responsive, powerful, familiar. The heavy train behind answered as if drawn by any other tank engine, but the crew understood the limits. The compact boiler, though efficient, could not sustain full steam for long. Every yard covered was a countdown. Eyes fixed on the speedometer, the driver watched for the crucial mark, five miles per hour. That was the signal. At this threshold, the piston's pace allowed the diesel cycle to take over. The driver reached for the diesel lever, cracked it open, and listened. The sound changed almost instantly. The gentle hiss of steam gave way to the deeper, sharper rhythm of combustion. Heavy oil injected into the cylinder ends ignited under compression, sending a new surge of force through the pistons. The locomotive was no longer just steam. It was both steam and diesel, two systems sharing the same heart. The driver began closing the steam regulator, cutting back the flow until only a faint trace remained for the auxiliaries. The fireman trimmed the oil burner, adjusting the flame as exhaust heat from the diesel side now fed the boiler. In the cab, the change was unmistakable. Vibrations sharpened, the exhaust note deepened, and the frame seemed to tense as mechanical power shifted from smooth expansion to the relentless beat of internal combustion. Operating the Kitson still was a choreography unique to its kind. Each departure began with the same ritual, oil burner lit, steam raised, silent launch. Then, at the right speed, a deliberate transformation Diesel engaged, steam receding, a new rhythm established. It was a living display of engineering ambition, played out every time the locomotive left the yard. For the crew, it was a test of timing and instinct, a matter of feeling the shift and trusting the hybrid heart to keep time. Inside the Kitson still cylinder block, metal lived in two worlds at once. The diesel side of each piston faced combustion temperatures that could soar to nearly 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Just a few inches away, the steam side lived in a realm closer to 400 degrees, hot but a world apart. This split personality was not just a technical curiosity. Every time the locomotive fired up, those temperatures pulled and pushed at the metal, stretching one end while leaving the other relatively cool. The result was a constant tug of war inside the casting itself. For the fitters in the Leeds shops, this invisible battle showed up as a hundred small headaches. Cylinder bores drifted out of round, sometimes just enough to let steam or oil slip past the piston rings. Gaskets that sealed perfectly cold would begin to weep as the block expanded unevenly. Packing glands on the rods needed constant attention as the alternating hot and cooler cycles would loosen their grip. Even the best alloys of the day struggled to keep up, forced to accommodate both the hammering shock of combustion and the steady pressure of steam. The materials themselves could only do so much. Cast iron, chosen for its strength and machinability, would start to show hairline cracks at the sharpest corners, especially where the diesel end's heat faded into the steam side's cooler zone. Over time, Repeated cycles of heating and cooling would encourage metal fatigue, and the block would begin to warp in subtle but relentless ways. Engineers tried to compensate with generous clearances and careful water jacketing, but the underlying problem never really went away. Every maintenance interval brought new surprises. What should have been a straightforward job, replacing a worn ring or tightening a head bolt, became a detective story. Was the leak coming from a failed gasket, a distorted bore, or a packing that had simply lost its spring? Each answer pointed back to the same root cause. A cylinder block asked to bridge a thermal canyon day after day. The Kitson still did not explode or seize in dramatic fashion. Instead, it wore itself out through a slow, grinding negotiation with the laws of physics and every hour spent in the workshop was a direct result of that internal struggle. The Kitson Still locomotive, once debugged, entered regular goods service in the Leeds area. LNER records show it worked heavy coal trains, including daily hauls between York and Derry Coats, 
and it even managed restarts on challenging gradients, a 700-ton train on a 1 in 33 grade. The efficiency claims held up under trial. By blending diesel combustion and steam recovery, the locomotive approached 40% thermal efficiency, far above the 10 to 12% typical for steam and better than most diesels of the day. Fuel bills reflected the savings, but the workshop ledger told another story. Every overhaul meant hours spent untangling a maze of valves, pipes, and seals, with fitters forced to dismantle both steam and diesel hardware for even routine jobs. The complexity that made the machine efficient also made it expensive to keep on the rails. By 1933, the Kitson still had proven it could do real work, but the costs mounted. Kitson and company, already struggling in a shrinking locomotive market, poured money and manpower into supporting their hybrid. Each maintenance cycle demanded specialized skills, custom parts, and downtime that no railway accountant could ignore. The locomotive had no siblings, so every repair required bespoke attention, no economies of scale, no shared spares. As the Great Depression deepened, orders for new engines dried up, and the company's finances grew precarious. On July 17, 1934, Kitson and company entered receivership. The hybrid locomotive, still unique in the world, was handed back to the receivers and quietly scrapped. While the Kitson still delivered on its promise of efficiency, it arrived at the wrong moment and in the wrong form. Across the channel and overseas, railways were trialing diesel-electric locomotives, machines that sacrificed a few percentage points of efficiency for something more valuable, simplicity. A diesel-electric used a standard engine to drive a generator, powering electric traction motors. Each component could be swapped, serviced, or upgraded without disturbing the whole. The Kitson still, by contrast, was a one-off tangle of ambition and compromise. Its efficiency was real, but its cost was fatal. In the end, the locomotive that tried to unite two eras became a casualty of its own complexity, and the company that built it disappeared along with it. Today, as engineers race to squeeze every drop of efficiency from machines, the Kitson Stills lesson endures. Complexity can sabotage even the most brilliant ideas. Modern hybrids and electrics pursue perfection, but simplicity often wins in the real world. In the end, it's not just about saving fuel, it's about building systems people can actually sustain. Thanks for watching. What modern, beautiful bad idea comes to your mind?